is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we have an opportunity to gather together as the people of God and behold our God as a congregation, as a church. He took away our sin and gave us his righteousness and he rose from the dead, proving victory. And that's how he showed his grace to us. To be made right with him, to receive forgiveness of sins is possible when you believe and you confess him as Lord. And that means that you say, God, I'm tired of living with me at the center and I want you to be my Lord and I want to turn from my sin and I want to trust in you and I want to submit my life to your law and submit my life to your word. And that is what it means to be a Christian. You have the same power in your life to share the gospel that Jesus Christ had in his life. You've got infinite power. You just don't see it. You don't believe it. Believe it. Believe Jesus gave you a gift to preach the gospel. The power that Jesus had is the power that we have when we believe, and Jesus used the power to preach and be a witness, and we are to use the power and preach and be a witness as well. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 15. Every week, we try and remind you that there are five things that God asks of His people to do in the New Testament, and so we ask people here at First Baptist to do them. We want you to grow in your relationship with Jesus, to serve, to share, to worship, and we want you to give. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we want to take some time and remind you of one of those. And at the beginning of this year, we're reminding you of the one to give. This is the final installment in a series uh, here at the beginning of the year about giving. We talked two weeks ago about the foundation of giving. We talked last week uh, about the fuel for giving, what propels us. And today, we're going to look at the fruit of giving. What happens when you give? We see it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 15, and this is what God says. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. While they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to pray with my family what I have been praying for them since the beginning of the year. And that is that you, by the grace of Jesus Christ, would make us into a congregation that is generous sacrificial and cheerful in our giving. And Father, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my most favorite fatherly activities is pestering my children. <laughs> A couple of weeks ago, I was doing that with my wonderful daughter. I was giving her as hard a way to go as possible, pushing and poking and teasing and tickling. She'd had enough. 
and she decided to uh, start giving it back as good as she was getting it. So she started giving me a hard way to go, and in the kerfuffle, she broke my glasses. It was an accident. She didn't mean to. It just could happen to anybody. But it was a bummer because these weren't like reading glasses that you could pick up at Walgreens. These were like the expensive bifocals. And it was even worse because just a couple of weeks before, another pair had gotten destroyed because my dog ate them. The dog ate them. <laughs> ate the glasses. So Barkley strikes and then Chloe strikes. And so I'm sitting here with this handful of former glasses and I just felt defeated. I didn't say anything to her. I wasn't upset at her. It was just an accident. But I just was bummed. I wake up the next morning and there's a note on my bed. And it says, Dad, I'm sorry I broke your glasses. I know I can't afford to pay for all of it, but here's all the money that I have. <laughs> and I hope you can, I hope you can get it fixed with this. And I opened up the note and there was all of the money that she got for Christmas and all of the money that she saved from her babysitting. And I said, good. <laughs> it's time to pay the piper. Somebody's got to pay this. <laughs> Actually, you know, my heart melted. I mean, my heart just melted. I did not ask her to do this. I did not demand that she do it. But what I loved is that my precious little girl, who just in an accident broke something expensive, her heart, without being asked, without being pressed, without any kind of demand, just overflowed to want to help. What my daughter did for me with that note is what God is asking you to do with him in this text. God wants you to give out of the overflow of the love in your heart. And he wants you to be in a really good mood about it. Look at verse 7 that we read. It says, each one, not the church, not the Sunday school class, not the small group, each one, each person must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. This is one of the reasons why every time we talk about this, every time the last several weeks, I've been saying there's no guilt trips here. I am not going to be the travel agent for your guilt trip about your relationship with money at this church. There's no guilt trip here. Here's the thing, I'm not even allowed to do it. The Apostle Paul says, if you're going to give the way God wants you to give, you can't do it grudgingly or under compulsion. As soon as I put a gun to your head, it doesn't count. So here's the thing, full disclosure, if you want to give out of guilt, if you want to give to make me stop talking about giving, just make this go away, I'm sick of hearing about it, I don't want it. Seriously, don't give it. If your heart isn't in it, it's not the kind of gift that the Lord wants. So you can just be totally released from the burden. Not grudgingly or under compulsion. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. God doesn't need your money. God wants your heart. And so he wants people to give because he has their heart. He, he wants people to give like Chloe gave to me, just out of the overflow of a heart that just wants to be happy and right and in good relationship and a part of good things. This is impossible, this kind of giving. And this kind of giving is really silly. It's really ridiculous. This is going to be one of the things that people in our city and people in our culture just can't understand. You mean to tell me that you've got your money and you're going to take a portion of it. You're going to take it out and you're going to give it away? You're not going to 
You're not going to get anything out of it. You're going to, you could have a car, or you could have another night out, or you could add that to savings, or you could get bifocals. (laughs) And you're not going to do it? You're going to give it away? This is something that makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense to the people out there. But it can make sense to the people in here. And for it to make sense, you're going to have to understand how this works. And the way this passage works, what it is, in verse 7, God says, I want cheerful givers. I want people who are thrilled to give. I want people who see that they can have a car or a house or a second house, who could have books and dinners out, and they don't give those things to themselves, but they give money to me. And what he does is he then explains to you how you could do this. And not just to do it, but to be really, really happy about it. This text is about explaining how you could be this kind of generous, sacrificial, and cheerful giver. And you know what? It's all based on promises. God makes you promises. Here are the good things that you're going to get if you won't hold on to your money. If you'll let go of the death grip on your money and give and invest in the kingdom, there's a bunch of good things that you're going to get. I can't tell you all of them this morning. We don't have the time, but I'll give you four. Here's the first one. When you give, you get more money. When you give, you get more money. This is the first thing that just seems absurd. What? You you just said, if I give away money, I'll get more money. And yes, but it's not my idea. I just ripped it right out of 2 Corinthians. God is able to supply your needs. Look at verse 8. God, this is what it says. God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. When you give, the God who gave you the money in the first place is going to see to it that you get more money. Now, if you think this sounds stupid, if you think that that math doesn't work, then let me encourage you to talk to people in our church. We have hundreds of people in our church who could share their giving testimony with you. And you, you listen to people in our church who would say, I have given faithfully for years. I've given reckless, crazy, stupid amounts. And they will tell you, I've never been able to outgive God. And you, you heard them say amen. If that's happened to you, just say amen. amen. There's so many people who know that there has been no ability on my part to give and not have God give abundance in return. There have been times in our life when I was a broke, poor seminary student. I mean, barely making, barely making a uh, a five-digit salary. And there would be times when the car would break or the air conditioner would go out or a kid would get sick and We would look at the budget, and it made no mathematical sense to take money and give it away without taking care of the car first or the kids first. There has never been a time, never been a time when we've come up short. Now, you could abuse that. You could abuse it. Some people abuse it this way. Well, since... God says he's going to give me everything. Um, It doesn't matter what I do with my money. I'll just live any way I want, and God will get my back. This is not a passage of Scripture that props up financial sin. You can't sin financially with your money and engage in all sorts of financial wickedness and then come and sponge it all away with a gift in the offering plate at church. God's got me. No, the the passage that we read says, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. This is about good deeds. It's not about wickedness. This also does not sponge away financial recklessness. 
If you want to not live on a budget, not save, and throw money over here, and throw money over there, and show up at church with a negative balance, and listen to the preacher say, hey, God's going to give you more money if you just write a check, this is not that. This is not about financial recklessness. The uh, passage says in verses 10 to 11, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvestness of your righteousness. This is a harvest of righteousness, not recklessness. This also is not the health and wealth gospel. Oh, I hate the health and wealth gospel. The health and wealth gospel turns grace into a transaction. If you write a check, God will give you grace. If you write a check, God will make you rich. If you write a check, God will make you healthy and you'll never get sick. That's not what this text says. What the text promises is that you'll get a harvest of righteousness. It says in verse 11, you'll be enriched in everything for all liberality. What it means is, is that when you give, God is going to see that you're never short money to give. It doesn't say that you'll stockpile money and be absolutely loaded. It doesn't say nothing ever bad is going to happen to you. But what he's saying is that when you give, you will always have enough money to give. You'll always have enough money to do good things. It's a promise. It's a glorious promise of grace that God is going to supply what he requires. God tells you in verses 6 and 7 to give and to give generously and to give sacrificially and to give cheerfully. And here comes the glorious promise that he's got your back to do that. It's grace. God gives what he demands. And you're never going to be burned for being righteous. When you give, you get more money. Here's the second thing you get. When you give, the kingdom is supplied. When you give, the kingdom is supplied. We live and breathe and move in the glorious kingdom of Jesus Christ. We're not doing political work here. What we do has political implications, but that's not what we're doing. We're not doing societal work here. What we do has societal implications, but that's not what we focus on. We focus on the kingdom of Christ. We believe that Jesus Christ lived and died and rose so that anyone who would turn from sin and trust in him can have life and have it forever. That's true for you. We take that message to this city, we take that message to this state, to this country, and to this world. And then when people are brought into the kingdom of Christ, our passion is to see them grow up in wisdom and maturity to become more like Jesus Christ. That is the job. We have not yet found a way to do that work for free. Wouldn't it be great if it didn't cost us any money to get that word out? That actually cost us a lot of money. Every kingdom has financial needs. And this kingdom of Jesus has financial needs. And what this passage says is that God is going to supply the needs of his people and his kingdom. In verse 12, it talks about fully supplying the needs of the saints. Fully supplying the needs of the saints. There's needs for utility bills. There's needs for digitization. Do you know that um, I regularly get communication from across the world from people who cannot meet for church services, for one reason or another. There might be an emergency in their area. Maybe they're in a closed country. Maybe there's some kind of COVID shutdown or whatever. I regularly get emails from across the country, and they tell me, when our church doesn't meet, we're watching you. That's a need you wouldn't think that a need of the saints is a live stream that's happening right now, and we want to welcome everybody who is watching that is going out all over the world and is supplying the needs of the saints. All of that requires financial investments, and what this is is God saying, I'm going to supply the needs of the saints. And he's going to do it through you. This is another reason why there's no guilt trips here. There's nothing to feel guilty about. 
God doesn't need your money. Well, why does God ask for my money if he doesn't need it? Because he loves you, and when you give, you get included in everything that you can't do. There are people, people in our church who really value teaching and preaching, and you'd love to do it, but you can't. Well, when you give, your gift supports all of the teaching, all of the preaching that we do all across this building, all the way down to Nocatee, all the way across the world. You're a part of it. Some people say, man, those vocalists sound so great. Didn't Angela do a great job singing this morning? And that, that choir sounds so good. And that orchestra sounds so good. I wish I could do it, but I, I want to do it. I want to play the piano. I want to play the cello. I want to. I had to give up. I realize I'm going to have to wait till heaven to figure that out. It's taken me too much time. But every time you give, your gift gets folded up into all of the ministries of our church, and you're a part of every song that gets sung. You're part of every beautiful note. We've got hundreds of people in our congregation who want to be here and can't for whatever reason. Hundreds of people. They watch every week. We're, again, glad you're here. Every week they give. And what that means is even though they can't be here every single week, they're a vital part of you and me in the ministry that we're doing. Your giving makes that possible. God is supplying the needs of the saints through you. When you give, you get to be a part of this. It's a glorious thing. Third, when you give, it produces gratitude and glory to God. When you give, people are thankful to God and people give glory to God. Look at this. In chapter 9, verse 11, it says, You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. It says in verse 12, The ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. When you give, people say, Thank you to God. But it's not just gratitude, it's also glory. In verse 13, it says, Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience. When you obey and give, when you're faithful to give, God gets glorified. People go, wow, God's amazing. God's great. God's incredible. This is weird too. You give... And people don't say thank you to you, but to God. You obey, and you don't get the credit. God does. It's your money, your obedience. People thank the Lord, and God gives, gets glory, and not you. Uh, that seems like a bum deal if you're not a Christian. But when you're a Christian, you understand the way this works. You know why it works. People thank God and give Him glory because they don't know who you are. Once you give your money, it's not your money anymore. It goes into the ministry of the church. That $225,000 you gave in December for the International Mission Board, that comes through our church, it goes to the IMB, and it's going to Zimbabwe. And the lost people who become found. The missionaries who live off that, they're never going to know your name. But I guarantee you they'll thank the Lord for it. And it will dumbfound people at the rich glory of God because they know how this works. We read this in verse 8. Remember? God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Where did the motivation to give come from? Where did the power to release your money, where did that originate? Verse 8 tells us it came from God. And so wise and mature Christians know how this works. And so they give glory to God, that God worked and He worked in you to give. I've told you. We've had, 
We've had times around here, oh my goodness, when COVID hit, I had no idea what was going to happen. We're right in the middle of this restructuring of property and restructuring of staff, and we did not account for a global pandemic and an economic constriction that came with it when we were going through it. And there were Sundays and Mondays when I was across the street in my office laying on the ground begging God to come through for us. And he always did. He always did. And there was, there's never been a week yet, no matter how covid things got, that I wasn't able to say, God, thank you. Uh, our needs were here. Our ability to meet them was here. And you provided way through the roof. God gets gratitude and God gets glory. And if you don't like that, if you say, well, I, I want to thank you. I want the glory. You got a problem. But if you say, people think the Lord. People think more of God because of my faithfulness. That's actually called being a Christian. When you give, you get more money. When you give, the kingdom is supplied. When you give, it produces gratitude and glory to God. And here's the last one. When you give, Christian unity and love will increase. When you give... Christian unity and love will increase. This is so good because we've talked about the gratitude going to God and the glory going to God. But none of that means that nothing happens interpersonally. None of that means that nothing happens in your relationships. In fact, what the Bible teaches is that glorious things happen in our relationships when we give this way. Look at verse 14. It says, while they also by prayer on your behalf yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. When this giving happens, the people who receive the gift yearn for the people who gave it. There's a yearning here. There's a longing for people when we give together. A month or so ago, when I stood before you and I announced all the incredible things that the Lord is doing through your gifts. We talked about the millions of dollars of projects in and around this room that you have fully funded. We talked about the expansion of the lobby that's happening out there right now that you have fully funded. We talked about the expansion and improvement of the senior adult space upstairs that the senior adults have fully funded. Funded. We talked about all this stuff. And one of the announcements that I made was that we had this 10-year plan to fix the sound in here. We got some old sound system stuff going on in here, and a lot of you are aware every week of how imperfect it can be. You tell me, you don't, I, when you talk quiet, we can't hear you. So I'm just going to look and see who's, so if you're not moving, you don't know what I just said. The sound can be kind of weird, and there's dead spots. There's a few of you that are in weird spots. And we had a, we had a long-term, a 10-year plan to fix it. It was going to cost $825,000. And I told you about a faithful member of our congregation who heard about the need and said, I'm taking care of all of it right now. And you were overjoyed. Well, a week or so ago, a lady came up to me, and she said, Pastor, that man who's given that $825,000. Is he married? <laughs> and I had to break it to her that yes, indeed, he's very married. And I won't tell you what she said. But it was, it was one word that indicated disappointment. <laughs> well, when the Apostle Paul says yearning, he's not talking about that kind of yearning, okay? It's not that. It's a yearning, he says, because of the surpassing grace of God in you. I see 
that God is moving in you and working in you. I see that God is moving in me and working in me. And, and our investment in the kingdom binds us together. And I long for you. I have, on those, uh, on those weeks when I have prayed, and on those weeks when the Lord has answered, and he's always come through, I know He's never come through with money out of a parachute from heaven. He's always come through, through you. And it, and it creates this joy and this participation that we're really all in this together. God is supplying the needs of his saints. The church is not in trouble in 2022. Don't watch cable and forget about 2 Corinthians. God's going to supply the needs of his kingdom. The church wins when this thing is over. The church is going to be fully and amply supplied, and it's going to be through you. And so we get to be a part of a family. It's like a family living together, and everybody works and makes their part and throws in their money to pay their part. We're like a great big family living in crucial and important and critical days. And we all get to throw in and we all get to link arms. You get to link arms with the people in this room that you don't know. And you get to link arms with the people in the first service. And you get to link arms with the people who are down at Nocatee right now. And you get to link arms with the people who are watching all over the world on the live stream. And we're all in this together. And it makes us love and long for one another. The Apostle Paul describes all of this. He describes that when you give, you're going to get more money. When you give, God's kingdom is going to be supplied. When you give, God's going to receive gratitude and glory and honor. And when you give, we're going to love each other more because we're in it together. And, and after he's taken the time to explain all of these gifts and all of this working, he says at the very end, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The gifts are so amazing. The list is so long. He says it's indescribable. I can't even describe how good it is. The gifts that you get. It brings us back to the very first verse. Verse 6 that I haven't talked about yet. It says, now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That says, if you want a little tiny bit of God's blessings, then you just give a little tiny bit. And you'll, that's, that's the amount of blessings that you'll get. You get a little bit of money to be a little bit invested in the work. You'll have a little small teeny part of supplying the needs of the kingdom. You'll have a little tiny part in God's greater glory. You'll be a little tiny part of the love and unity that characterizes this body of believers. You get a little tiny bit. But you don't want that. Do you? The promise is that if you want a lot of blessing, then sow bountifully. And you'll be a massive part of what God is doing. And you'll get a massive part of the blessing. It's not just money. It's all of the blessings that accrue when you get massively invested in the kingdom of Christ. You're going to get a massive return on the investment. When Chloe gave me her 13-year-old wad of cash. Oh my goodness, my heart broke. I would sooner have taken a bullet in the chest than spend a penny of that repairing my glasses. I, I took that money to her and I said, honey, you've been saving this money. This was an accident. It wasn't your fault. Please don't, please don't give me this money, but please let me take you 
to get you a milkshake. <laughs> but this, is just, this is just one tiny little illustration that like she gave everything she had and she got that plus a milkshake. This is the way God does it. Do you think God has more than milkshakes for you? Do you know, by the way, I also took the glasses into the doctor's office and they fixed them for free. So, see, the Lord had everything taken care of. Should have kept the money, could have spent it on something. <laughs> could have taken her mother out to dinner. I'm kidding. And I'm just me. God owns everything. He can give you infinitely and abundantly more than glasses and milkshakes. Here's the key fact. When you bless others with your gifts, God is absolutely positively going to bless you with His. I just read it to you. This is the promise of the Word of God. When you bless others with your gifts, God is going to bless you with His. And if you believe that, you will give generously sacrificially, and you'll give very cheerfully. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, please help us to give generously, sacrificially, and cheerfully. For the sake of Jesus Christ, because we have received his grace. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.